It's now my pleasure to introduce the Reverend Elizabeth A. Eaton, presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Bishop Eaton, we are blessed to be able to share our time with you this afternoon. Your life is a testament to what people can accomplish if they are dedicated and passionate. As a junior high school student, you aspired to be a Lutheran pastor, even though the church did not ordain women at the time. Not far, you far exceeded that goal by becoming the first female bishop of the Northeast Ohio Synod, then rose to become the first woman to be the spiritual leader for millions of Lutherans around the country. Your vision, compassion, and achievement are inspiring, but another one of your traits that our graduates and their friends and families would do well to emulate is your resiliency of spirit, which can be seen in your lifelong allegiance to Cleveland sports teams. <laughs> Our respected and inspirational leader, we are confident Bishop Eaton's words will serve as a great launching point for our graduates as they embark on their own trailblazing journey. Bishop Eaton. President Van Aken, honorable trustees, distinguished faculty, graduates, parents, families, and friends, grace and peace to you. That was starting to sound like the Academy Awards, wasn't it? We're going to go on there for a long time. I, um, you have an extremely well-organized and disciplined staff here, and the good thing is that I also have an extremely well-organized and disciplined staff, so they left me out of the middle of it while they're trying to get all the arrangements worked out today, because I'm not quite that it's um, well organized. And so we were communicating what the title would be for this um, commencement address. And I said it should be religion versus reason, question mark. And the question mark got left off. So I'm wondering if that's uh, maybe some serendipitous irony that's being, happening there. Um, but I want to I speak a little bit about that because I don't know if you know this or not, but you are going to be graduates of Lutheran higher education. How many even know what Lutherans are? out there. You, thank you in the first row from <laughs> my former parish. Thank you. It's great. I think today in particular, um, the, the, the topic of religion is coming up over and over again in the news and cropping up around the world. And people might begin to wonder, is there a peaceful and constructive role for religious practice, belief, and communities in the world today? When we see things as they happen in Syria and Iraq, uh, in our own country, in, in Florida, with the, the threatened burning of a Koran or a protest against a mosque at Ground Zero. Though I don't if you remember that, in 2010, but there is a mosque at Ground Zero. There is a mosque in the United States Pentagon to make it possible for Muslim service people to exercise their religion, something for which they signed up to sacrifice their lives if necessary to defend First Amendment. It didn't used to be a question, reason versus religion. If we zoom back to the Middle Ages, how many um, European history classics majors do we have here? Just a couple, so if I get this wrong, you'll just, good, thanks, I appreciate that. So in the Middle Ages, in a liberal arts education in those days, theology was considered the queen of the sciences. Theology was science and the chief of all sciences. People could understand and explore the world based on revealed truth as they understood it in Western Europe coming from the Holy Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament. And that was, that was fine. It held the world together, and, and things seemed to work pretty well until people began to delve more deeply into how the world is put together. And then in one of those, what do you call it now, epic fails? Is that one of the term you use, epic fails of the church? We really thought that Galileo and Copernicus had it completely wrong. We've, we've apologized for that now in, in recent years. But then, you know, with the Renaissance, but particularly with um, the Enlightenment, the role of, of religion as a province of meaning, and particularly the role of religion as a way of knowing and understanding the created and natural world began to slip. And instead, grew, growing ever more strongly was this notion of empirical science, that it was possible by using the scientific method, no, no offense, Dr. Mainpa, I, I like the scientific method, um, the scientific method that we could discover the truth about the world and that religion no longer can speak of a universal truth because there was an agreement and you cannot measure or do exper repeatable re experiments on religious belief or religious feeling or religious community, or so we thought. 
And so with the Enlightenment, religion began to sort of come more and more into the background of being a, a, a matter of personal choice, something that one did privately, and not something that could really bring enlightenment to the rest of the world. And science seemed to be the answer that would bring fulfillment to humankind, that would bring peace on earth, that would bring international brother and sisterhood, and finally the world would, would realize its ultimate its potential because we could find the facts. So lately, I think we've begun to understand that you cannot separate a person's religious or spiritual part from his or her intellectual inquiry part, and that both religion and reason are just trying to find a coherent way to find a coherent worldview, and they're both necessary. Science actually became a kind of religion and a kind of ideology, and I would dare say after having watched the Big Bang Theory, and will now explain to you the human Heisenberg on principle, uncertainty principle, that we know that when one observes something, one automatically changes that which one is observing. All scientists are human beings. All people of reason are human beings, and we bring all of those things that formed us into play. So what do we do? Do we go back to religion being the exclusive province of meaning and the, the exclusive way of finding and understanding truth? Or do we exclude that completely and say there's no place for that in the public square or in universities and colleges? Going and now achieving a degree from a Lutheran, an institution of Lutheran higher education, we have decided in the Lutheran tradition that there is a third way. It's not necessary to, to divide into sectarian sort of clans and tribes, nor is it necessary or even helpful to say no to such an important part of our human existence. So how do we do this? especially when we see that, that people have some really unpleasant understandings about the church. We'll just pick on the Christians for right now because that's what the Pew Research did. How the church is perceived, particularly by people, men and women, your age. When the Pew Research Institute did surveys, they found out that people think religious people are hypocritical, judgmental, and insincere. Religious people are partly true, but none are completely true. Religious institutions are too focused on rules and not spirituality. Let me tell you about that spiritual and religious thing. I think you're onto something. But it used to gall me when I served in the parish across the border in Ashtabula, Ohio, when I'd have parishioners who did not come to church say, I can worship God in the beauty of a mountaintop or in a sunset. And I would say, you're in Ohio. But I think in some ways they were seeing that the church had become religious and not spiritual. So that's another critique. Another one is religious leaders want money and power. Well, I wouldn't mind a little bit more money for the ELCA if you want to take up a collection. That would be just fine. And Bishop Jones from North uh, Western uh, Pennsylvania would be happy too. And then also religious people are anti-science which in this day and age is probably one of the most condemning uh, accusations that one can make about the church. And it probably leads people to say, I will have nothing to do with an institution about that. But in the Lutheran tradition, we actually have this, this sort of habit and tradition of saying we can be both and. Um, you've got Latin on your, um, your, uh, your, your motto, so I think you'll understand this right away. We are simul justus et peccator. So we are at the same time justified and, and, and condemned. We're both saints and sinners at the same time, which is a tension that we hold together as human beings. And the Lutheran tradition wants to explain this, and I think I believe that you've experienced it at this institution. We would say to those, those accusations that were garnered in the Pew Research that, you know what, the first one, religious people are hypocritical, judgmental, and insincere? You bet. You bet. And I can tell you that our congregations have pews devoted to whatever kind of hypocrisy you want to bring there because we understand that we're sinful and broken people. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, because of God's loving intention, we've been made whole. So we're not perfect, but we have the potential to live into the new life that we have in Christ. And we're, we're, we're so focused on, on rules that's, you know, think about that. We're focused on rules, and this is a terrible thing. And uh, we would say, in fact, that um, we would um, understand that the, the gospel is not really a book of laws and commandments. This is what Luther would say, which requires deeds from us. But the gospel instead is a book of divine promises. There is freedom. There is freedom in the gospel and in religious expression. 
And then people would say that, that religious institutions are too focused on, on, on rules and not spirituality. And we'd say, well, no, the world's a messy place. It is going to be a messy place. You've experienced that in trying to work your way through to the degrees you would be receiving today. And your parents, I'm sure, have experienced that in raising you. I mean, it was worth it, wasn't it, parents? There you go. It's a messy place, but God has redeemed this messy place. And one would say, you know, that religious leaders want money and power. The Reformation was started, will be 500 years ago, to speak against institutions that were based solely on garnering more money and more power. And that religious people are anti-science, anti-intellectual? Gee, Martin Luther was a college professor at a university. In, in, in intense, acute, Academic inquiry is part of the DNA of a Lutheran institution. And your professors, your faculty have never shied away about that. There is no litmus test to attend a Lutheran institution of higher learning, except that you would have an open mind and be willing to be engaged in, in, the, in the wonder and the mystery of God's creation. And as you delve more deeply into questions that seem to be unanswerable, you can, dis, you can discover and uncover the intricacy and the elegance of the creation. Knowledge is something that God wants us to use. The Episcopalians had this wonderful campaign, and one of the things they said is, Jesus died to take away your sins, not your brain. So now, with this balance, this, this Lutheran understanding that we're both and, that we're set free, that we are, we are in fact gifted with intellect and inquisitiveness to discover even more fully about the world, and also our deep sense of vocation, that we weren't, you're not just going to be sent out in the world today just to make it. You're going to be sent out in the world to make the world a better place. That's your call and that's what this institution has done. That's, that's how we understand our lives. We're not here to hold on to our lives, but to spend them lavishly in service to the neighbor. And the neighbor can be somebody here in Greenville or can be somebody in Pakistan or China or Baltimore. Anywhere anywhere. And these people need to know that this life and this world is precious and it's worth, worth living and it's worth serving. Well, now that we understand that, that we're not going to exclude science or reason or exclude religion, that there's a middle way, that, that life is a mixed bag and, and it's messy and God's there helping us and partnering with us as he calls us into partnership in the midst of that mess, but promising that there is in fact a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, design for all of us, a design that is, is made manifest in the love of God for all people. To what end? If this is merely an hypothesis, then what does this mean? And what do your degrees mean if it's simply a means to an end, making money, which, you know, I hope that happens in this economy. We want that to happen. And I'm sure your parents want that to happen because they paid a lot of money for this expensive education. I am still paying off some student loans myself. It, it gets better, parents. It, it, they're almost done. The kids have been out for a while. So what, what did you do this all for? We hope at this institution, at Teal College, that you did this so that you will spend your lives in service to a world God so loves. That because God has found each individual being on this earth precious and fascinating, you will do the same thing. And you will do that especially and particularly in those places where people feel that they are not precious, where they're of no interest to anyone, where they have no voice, where they're marginalized, where they're vulnerable. That is where your gifts are being called for. When we take a look today at the peaceful demonstrations in Baltimore, call it calling for equity, something upon which this country was founded but we have not yet achieved, it's going to be your job in whatever way you can to say no. Everyone is created with dignity and how can we live more fully into the promise of this country that it was created and we pledge that it was liberty and justice for all. And how do we, in the places where we work, or in our neighborhoods, or our families, instill in others that it's not just about getting as much as you can get while you can get it? I don't know if you've ever seen that bumper sticker, the one who dies with the most toys wins? Yeah. No. The one who dies with the most toys is dead, and leaving it up to all the relatives to clean out the house when it's all done. You've been given everything, everything, in the love and support of your families and friends, and the dedication of your faculty, your comrades here, 
and in the gifts of your intellect and your, your determination, it is no small thing to graduate from college nowadays. It becomes more and more difficult, but you've done it. So never sell yourselves short. You are gifted people, and you're the ones that we from Teal are sending forth out into the world, a world that is so different from when we were graduating, a world that changes daily. And we want, when you're out there, to hold on to both reason and religion, to be engaged in, in eco, uh, intellectual inquiry, but also realize that there's some things that are matters of the spirit that might not be able to be parsed out by empirical data. I'm going to probably posit that when in you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, when, when you're coming toward the end of your life, it's not going to be clutching your iPhone 500 that's going to give your life meaning but it's a sense that you are loved and gifted by one who knows and loves you completely and that you have spent your life expressing that lavish love every way that you can as you serve. I, I feel for the faculty now. I remember when I was serving in the parish and we'd bring the catechism students before the church council and the church council could quiz the catechism students and I'd always sit there thinking, oh, please, please, God, I hope they paid attention. And often they did and sometimes they didn't. Your, your faculty have invested their lives in you. And this, you are the fruit of their labor. They have a huge investment in you. And your parents and family and friends do also. But now you will begin to have an investment in the classes coming after you. Make that investment something that's, that's glorious and wonderful and full of wonder, as Pastor Thompson said. This, this wonderful privilege and honor and adventure of serving. And when you go out there in the world, Write home and tell us how it's going. God bless you all and congratulations.